Kelly, you want to go to the next slide? Okay, before we launch into the, the um, substance of the program, just want to go over a few little details. Um, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. That's to control background noise and things like that. Um, there is a great way to communicate with us uh, if you have questions for the panel, which we hope you do. Um, you can use the Q&A feature on, uh, in your taskbar on the right there. Um, and if you have questions for the organizers, uh, the very capable Kelly Domino and myself, who will be running this webinar, um, you can put those in the questions. Uh, you can send, uh, I'm sorry, in the chat box. You can chat um, with the whole uh, audience or just with Kelly and myself or with the panelists. So we encourage you to ask questions um, as we go along and uh, use the chat feature to let us know if you have any problems or issues. Um, also wanted to let you know that a recording of this session will be available after the webinar has ended and a recording of our first session, which uh, aired on October 30th, is available now. Um, and you'll be able to get those. We'll give you the link. Um, so this webinar is part of a four, a four webinar series to launch the Renew Initiative. Um, Renew is a new initiative that brings together industry groups and municipalities to implement collaborative programs to advance recycling. Um, you know, munis muni the, <laughs> the municipalities know that you hear a lot of negative news about recycling these days, the challenges in the markets, the rising costs, the operational issues and contamination, but you don't always hear um, the more positive news, that there are programs out there, that there are industry groups out there that are, are willing to help to solve problems and build resilient programs. Today, um, we'll hear from three programs. Can you go to the next slide, Kelly? Um, uh, we'll hear from three speakers about three different programs that target uh, businesses and institutions. Uh, first, we'll hear from Derek Brown, who'll tell us about recycling cartons in schools. Um, Kara Pokiro from APR will talk about recycling uh, rigid plastics from grocery stores. And Bill Clark and Chris Fisher will talk about recycling glass um, from bars and restaurants. And all of these programs look at uh, targeting uh, different materials from the commercial and institutional sector in innovative ways. As I mentioned, this is part of a series. The next in our series will be on Tuesday, December 5th, where we'll talk about innovative industry problem solving. Um, things like rewall, uh, which is a, a new material, building material made with recycled cartons. The ACC wrap program for uh, recycling flexible plastics. And a new program from the US Business Council for Sustainable Development um, in consultation with GM which is around industry uh, material exchanges. So um, please do think about joining us for that. And the last in the series will be in January, a date to be determined, um, where we'll talk about partnerships for leading practices. So you see our, our email address here, renew at recycle.com for more information on the upcoming webinars or any follow-up for today. So. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, uh, you see me there, I'm Risa Domino, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, and behind the scenes, we have the very capable uh, Kelly Domino running the show. Um, our presentations today will start with Derek Brown. Um, Derek is the Director of Sustainability for Evergreen Packaging, um, headquartered in Memphis, Tennessee. He's been involved in the Carton Council for many years, and he leads evergreen sustainability programs, including carton recycling and sustainable forestry initiatives. He is a key player in the Carton Council's recycling campaign, and he'll talk to us today about the council's efforts to implement carton recycling in schools. After we hear from Derek, um, we'll hear from Kara Pokiro, the communications director for the Association of Plastics Recyclers. 
Um, CARA oversees the implementation and promotion of APRs technical, educational, and market development programs and is responsible for communications, conferences, and programs there. And today, CARA will provide us with an overview of the APR's grocery rigid packaging, a plastics packaging recycling program. And last, we'll hear from Bill Clark and Chris Fisher. Um, Bill Clark is Regional Sourcing Manager for Strategic Materials. He's been recycling glass for more than a decade, working at Reflective Recycling and launching the BevCon Bar and Restaurant Recycling Program in North Carolina. So Bill will tell us about how he has worked uh, through strategic materials with Chris and um, others to facilitate bar and restaurant recycling in the Southeast. Chris Fisher is president and ecopreneur at Fisher Recycling, which he founded in 1992 to provide recycling services to local restaurants. Over the years, Chris has built that business to serve more than 800 restaurants um, and to focus on glass bo bottle recycling from bars and restaurants. So he'll give us some insight today about how his bar and restaurant program works and how he works with Strategic as well as producing his own product. So with that, I'd like to hand it over and, uh, to Derek who will talk to us about school carton recycling. So good afternoon, everyone. This is Derek Brown. Talk about our school carton recycling program. Let me first tell you a little bit about the Carton Council and, and how we started and who we are. Uh, it's a group of manufacturers. We came together in 2009 to work on carton recycling and to increase access to carton recycling across the country. In 2009, there was about 24% access to carton recycling and we're, we're a little over 60% access to cart, carton recycling today. All the manufacturers of gable top and aseptic cartons came together in 2009. That's Allopack, Evergreen Packaging, SIG, Combi Block, along with Tetra Pak. Nippon Dynawave, that used to be the, the warehouse facility in Washington, is also an associate member of the Carton Council. So we came together to work on a strategy and, and uh, methods to improve access to carton recycling. As you will see, cartons are also used a lot in schools and so we thought that would be a good opportunity to get the word out and also to increase recycling and recovery of cartons. On the next slide you will see our goal and that really is to establish sustainable recycling programs for both food and beverage cartons. As you see on the shelves today there are a fair number of food type materials that are non-carbonated, non-aggregate type foods which are also in, in cartons and then beverage cartons. So you have dairy, juice, milk, uh, and, and non-dairy type beverages and cartons. As I mentioned earlier, we're working to increase access and also increase participation. And what we mean by that is the recycling rate of cartons overall. So how do we do that? The next slide shows that adding school recycling to our equation was important as we looked at the amount of cartons which were out there and were in schools and again, as getting the word out, it was a really good opportunity to work with schools and to work with the, the nutrition, sanitation, and all the different folks and all the different players in the school recycling community. We've also seen it as, as a way to help improve access to recycling because some schools will help drive access in their communities. They want to, to uh, add cartons into their system. And so in order to do that, the communities that the, the parent teacher associations will approach the schools and will approach the community to add cartons as well. So we've, we have also seen some opportunities there. So on the next slide, it shows that schools generate a lot of cartons. The average elementary student consumes a little over 130 servings of milk or juice a year. There's about 6 billion cartons are used in schools each year. So at the average elementary school with that 500 and 35 students is about 75,000 cartons a year. So it is an opportunity in order to recover that material and get that material cycled. As you know, the flow of material from schools and commercial uh, entities is, is a bit different than the curbside. So it does offer some unique challenges from, from curbside operations. So what's in it for schools? Why would schools want to do this? 
as we showed on the previous slide, they generate a large amount of cartons, and there's a lot of volume there if those cartons are not are not managed properly. Increasing waste costs, how waste are managed, and each school has a, a, a different contract. The contractual obligations and opportunities at schools are different, and that's something that we encourage schools as we work with them to understand is what are the contractual obligations. Some have to pay more for recycling if they generate more. Some have to pay less, so there are different opportunities there and different obligations. But in many cases, there are some cost savings if waste is moved from the waste container into the recycling container. And as you will see later, the other opportunity here is to get the residual milk out of the cartons for recycling, and that's a way to really improve, reduce the amount of waste, and also reduce the mess for custodians and the amount of waste that's generated in the liquid waste that potentially goes to the landfill or goes to the recycling program. It also teaches students valuable lessons and engages those students and take that message home. As we know, the, the children, the kids are the future, but getting change and getting culture change within the communities is, is, is long-term. While we need short-term gains, uh, it's a long-term gain as well in order to get schools and get the kids involved and engaged. And many schools we see have green goals and green targets and, and zero waste goals, and we're seeing that more and more with an opportunity to engage both the students and the teachers and the community and the parents. So let's talk more about building the school recycling program and what our approach is. So the first thing we do is, is there access to carton recycling in the community that's interested? So if there's not access to carton recycling, then it, there's not really an opportunity for them to, to recycle cartons. The second piece is, what is the contract? Who is the contract with. We encourage the schools that we work with to understand who the contractor or who the provider is if they're able to process cartons or get it to a material recovery facility that can. And then we support that schools, the schools to establish a carton recycling program through providing different materials and information. So in building that school recycling program, our approach has been to share best practices. One thing we have seen across the country is there is a lot of different ways to do carton recycling. They're from extremely inexpensive to some quite expensive systems. So there's a variety of opportunities out there for each individual school to do what works for them best. And what we have tried to do is to provide different best practices that we see across the country and then provide the technical expertise to what we've seen along with those tools and resources. We have best practices guide. We have posters, as you can see here. We have drink, empty, recycle uh, posters that are, that are available. And we also have grants available that we can share with, with different communities between providing monetary grants for schools to also providing recycle bins for schools. Our best practices guide that we have it's a, that is available on our website, on the cartonopportunities.org website, is not only for cartons, and what we advocate for and what we support is, is carton recycling, but a lot of the work that we do is for other materials that are generated both in the cafeteria and in, in the classroom as well, because breakfast is going to the classroom, and then back of house in the cafeteria is also opportunities there. So how does, how does this program work? What do you do? It's really pretty simple, is when you disassemble, the students disassemble their lunch, they empty the milk residue into some sort of container. We have found a five gallon bucket works good. It's pretty small, but we have seen all sorts of different approaches from a large bin, a large trash can, to different types of containers on dollies and with spigots on them so the custodian can actually just roll it over to a drain and drain it out. As many of you know and have seen, a lot of the milk gets dro dropped from the waste collection area out to the dumpsters. And so what we see over the long term is once you can engage the custodians, most custodians actually like it. They're not moving more, more material out. They're actually taking and managing the liquid separately from the solid waste and from the recyclable material. So once the material, the milk or the juice is, is dumped out of the container, out of the carton, into the container, and then recycle those cartons, and then put the organics and the other materials into a separate bin. So there's usually a little disassembly st uh, station for the students to, to use. On the next slide, it shows one of those stations and, and how flexible it can be. It can be from something 
extremely simple that you see here from, from just five gallon buckets that are used in the cafeteria to different containers that are out there. So we've also seen some pretty complex systems that are available at, at some schools. It does not have to be complicated, simple works. We do see some of the best practices to not using plastic bags for the recyclables when they go into the, to the recycle bin at the end. And, and managing that residue is probably one of the most important things. The other thing we see is green teams, is having green teams, having students that are interested and engaged. And we've actually seen a lot of students take, this, take a lot of pride in this and leading this effort and helping work with and talk to other students in order to do this correctly and properly as they're executing and implementing this program. So the Carton Council is here to help. We help schools. We offer assistance to different schools from this is an example of our recycle bin that is available. We've, we've distributed over 1,200 bins since we started in 2015. We do have some monetary grants to help schools get the program set up. And again, each school is different. And, and we're very flexible as to how it can be implemented. We see that as being very important. <clears throat> and I, as I mentioned earlier, the startup guide and best practices guide of those posters materials. We, the startup guide, I think we're on our third version now. We continue to revise that guide. It is long, but it has a lot of different pieces and components in it. There are opportunities to improve programs and to implement programs in various school districts. There's lesson plans available, and there's also activities for schools. We have a dedicated team as well. We have a few folks in the Carton Council that we work with that can also go to schools and talk to educators, to custodians, and to others in the school district to help them get that program set up. Let's look at a couple of success stories that we have out there. In Rockland County, New York, we piloted at three schools, reduced about 70% of that cafeteria waste by implementing a carton recycling program, along with food waste diversion. We see working with food waste diversion is also a big opportunity as we're working to set up a cart recycling program and some communities that are looking to do cart recycling. And you see, this is a, uh, an example of some fun things that, that students have done. We have seen all sorts of things that schools do, but this is a way to, to, to engage the students a little bit more into how they dump those materials into, that, into the bucket that's under that red table along with how you, where you put in the carton, where you put in other materials, because you can also build a table like that in order to separate other waste and organic waste and make it fairly simple. You can also see students here engaged and participating in this type of program. At the White Bear Lake Schools in Minnesota, there was a program there to target about a million cartons that were generated annually. Uh, and there were some other initiatives there to help, again, reuse re with reusable trays and organics collection. In this particular case, they were able to reduce hauling fees by about $70,000 and then increase the version of the cafeteria was increased from 2% to 48%. You see, this is one of the more elaborate systems here. It's a stainless steel table. These are not inexpensive, but with nice graphical representation of what to do. It's a very efficient system and it's a very effective system, but it is more expensive than some of the other systems that are out there. But again, it depends on the school system, the capability and interest uh, of those school systems as to how to implement the program. But that shows you a little bit of a range of the opportunities that are out, that are out there. So on the next success story, um, we'll talk about a summary here. So we have, in our mission, we have a mission to increase the recycling of cartons. We see school as a major opportunity. They're a major generator of cartons, but not, not only because of cartons, because of the other waste that's out there and the ability to recycle organic materials and also get the residue, both the milk and the juice out of those cartons and manage them separately. Do not get them into the waste stream and don't get them into the race, recycling stream. With these schools having their environmental, their green goals, and also a lot of parents, we see a good bit of interest from parents. We can turn those into uh, quantitative objectives for schools, and then that can also tie easily into carton recycling. As I mentioned, we have those tools on our website at cartonopportunities.org, along with best practices and technical assistance to, to establish these programs. So that's a summary. If you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer them, but we do have a good number of resources at cartonopportunities.org, along with recyclecartons.com. Thank you for participating today. 
Thank you, Derek. And um, folks who are listening, please uh, put some questions in there in the question box and we'll address all of them at the end of the webinar. Um, so, Kara, we'll go to you next. Thanks, Risa. Um, as Risa mentioned earlier in the introductions, um, I'm the communications director for APR, which is the Association of Plastic Recyclers. And um, one term that we've been seeing quite a bit in the sustainability world is, is a circular economy. And that's what I was referring to in that last slide. Um, and um, at APR, we believe that you can't have a circular economy without recycling. And so the program that I'm going to talk about today is just another way to recycle more material. Um, so who is APR? Uh, we're an international trade association representing the plastics recycling industry. Um, we have a wide variety of members. Um, our full members are the companies that actually recycle those plastics. So the recyclers are sometimes referred to as reprocessors. Uh, but we also have a wide variety of affiliate members that range from consumer brand companies, equipment manufacturers, label manufacturers, um, other trade associations, um, consultants, basically any company that's committed to the success of plastic recycling. So at APR, we consider ourselves the voice of all those members. So we're the voice of plastics recycling. Uh, we have three primary goals at APR. We're always working to increase the supply and enhance the quality of recycled plastics. And an important part of that is also to consistently communicate the value of recycled plastics. And so the program that I'm talking today about recycling rigid plastics in grocery stores, of course, that fits right into APR's primary goals. Um, it will increase the supply going into the market and the quality of material coming from those great from the grocery stores is great. So it's really good, clean material. So at grocery stores, um, our grocery store rigid plastic recycling program, we're talking about um, um, the plastics that are behind the counter. And these grocery stores generate a lot of valuable recyclable plastics. Um, the majority of the plastics that we're talking about today are number two, HDPE plastics, and number five, polypropylene plastics. They're also food grade plastics, which is very important in the recycling world. They can touch food. And they're also natural or white. So all of this material, when it's processed, is easily, color easily colored. Um, as I mentioned, they're all generated behind the counter and all of that material together, um, when we're talking about grocery stores with an annual sales of over $2 million, $2 million produce over 350 million pounds of rigid plastics each year. So that's a lot of material. So about five years ago, um, this program started, um, actually closer to six now, and at that time there were about 250 stores nationwide that were already recycling rigid plastics. Um, the estimated volume recycled at that time was around one million pounds. And um, once we started this outreach program and developed all kinds of resources to really expand this recycling practice, as you can see it's really grown now. So we've moved to 32 states, 10 national chains, and we've also gone from about 250 stores to 4,500 stores. And it's grown from 1 million pounds to now 18 million pounds of material recycled annually. So what type of rigid plastics am I talking about? Of course, I mentioned that they're mostly high density polyethylene and polypropylene, and those include buckets, pails, totes, boxes, all of the types of things that you see in these photos here that are generated behind the counter at grocery stores. And when I mean behind the counter, I mean the areas that I'm talking about in the next slide. So you won't, we're not talking about the material that customers access on the shelves. This type of material is generated in your bakery, your seafood department, the deli department, and also even stock bottles from the pharmacy.
So how are they recycled? This can happen in a variety of ways. Um, some stores continue with a single stream recycling system, meaning that they mix these plastics with other materials and recycle them in a single stream system. Um, other stores, they'll backhaul to their distribution center after all the buckets and totes have been stacked in to boxes, as you can see in that first photo on the bottom. Um, we commonly recommend to use the a lot of those big produce boxes where larger fruits and vegetables come in like watermelon. And they stack those up in there and they'll backhaul them to their distribution center and then they can be directly cross docked into a plastic recycler's trailer. Um, the last way that they can do this, they again, they backhaul into the distribution center but then rather than directly into the recyclers trailers, they bail that material for shipment to the plastic recycler. And we found that um, grocery stores will receive the best value from this material in, with that third option when the material is bailed. So we, um, when this program began, we developed a website and we have a lot of resources available on the website for grocery stores. So in the next few slides I'll just kind of go through some of those. Um, there's a best management practices guidebook. This is um, an extensive detailed guidebook that was also recently updated about a year ago so to ensure that all the information is current. Um, really includes step-by-step -step information about how to start the program. It includes um, photos and it also includes a lot of numbers with economics and things like that. Um, we have a whole series of videos that are also available on the website. Uh, the Recycling Makes Sense really makes the case for the showing that grocery stores do really receive value from this program rather than in the past when a lot of grocery stores would simply landfill this material they would actually spend money to get rid of this material and it would just be going to the landfill but if they participate in this program they can actually sell this material to the plastic recyclers which leads to additional revenue for the chains um, the Recycling Made Easy video really um, just kind of explains how to set up your cycle step by step or set up this program step by step. Um, completing the cycle shows uh, the type of material that these can be made into once they have been reprocessed. A lot, I'm sure everyone's heard that a lot of studies show that people are more likely to recycle when they understand the process a little better and that those um, plastics do actually go into new products. And I'm sure the same would hold true for these grocery stores just to kind of help them understand that we have available on the website. These really help the grocery stores understand those step, each step of the program to really visualize um, how to do um, each process or each step in the process. And they also show a lot of information about bailing. And these are all available to download to those grocery stores as well. Um, some of them will use them in their signage. Um, and we also have um, example signage for those stores to use available as well. Um, I've talked a lot about economics today and how um, grocery stores um, receive value for this material um, and really add to their revenue. Um, we have a series of worksheets also available on the website that include how to calculate the exact 
um, revenue that could be made available, and also the economics of bailing and how um, grocery stores can receive additional, even additional revenue if they bail the material. And finally, we also um, provide technical assistance. Um, we set up a series of calls to have with the grocery stores. Um, it starts with an introductory or kind of exploratory call with the leadership, just to explain to them how the program works and how it can benefit their stores. Um, and then beyond that, we set up a series of development calls to help them really get started with the program, to answer any questions they might have along the way. Um, we also work with them to design a a uh, training program specific to their stores um, to ensure that all of their employees are well aware of all the different steps of the program. And then beyond that, we still set up up to th uh, three or so progress and assessment conference calls as well to just kind of see, okay, how are you doing? You know, what are the types of questions we can Of course, it's just another recycling program to add to the list of, of how your community, your city, or your municipality is working to expand recycling. It also promotes sustainable businesses. Um, it decreases the amount of material that's going into the landfill. And of course, it, it um, provides positive partnership opportunities um, well beyond just um, you know between the grocery stores, um, local recycling companies and beyond. Um, and there is our website, plasticsrecycling.org. And on our website, you can always find um, links to go to the Recycling um, Grocery Rigid Plastics website. Um, there's my email, Kara at plasticsrecycling.org. Um, like Risa said, please type in any questions and we'll answer those at the end. But if you think of any after the session, please feel free to send me an email. And that is all I have for today. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, again, please keep those questions coming. We have a few queued up for the end, um, but we'll, we'll ask all the questions once the speakers are through. Um, next, we'll have Bill Clark, who's going to talk to us about strategic, and then uh, he'll flow right into Chris's presentation. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thanks, Bill. Okay, we can start with the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about who Strategic Materials is, why we even bother with glass, uh, some collection strategies, and why should people partner with Strategic Materials. The next slide. Next. We're the largest glass recycler in North America. We have almost 50 plants. Uh, we've been doing this for over a hundred years, and I refer to us not as a glass recycler, but a manufacturer that takes as a raw material recycled glass, post-consumer, post-industrial glass, and makes products out of it for industry. We make cullet, we make abrasive products, we make plastic, fiberglass, raw material, uh, the plastics we make fillers for, we make paint fillers, uh, reflective beads, all these sorts of raw materials for those uh, other industries. 
recycled glass reduces manufacturing costs of those industries and it improves the sustainability and it decreases the amount of material going to a landfill. Next slide. This is our 100 year timeline. We keep progressing, introducing new uh, innovations in glass recycling. And most recently, we purchased a company called Reflective Recycling and added 25% more uh, capacity to our processing. Next slide. This is a nice map of our footprint. You can see all the little dots there. That's where we maintain manufacturing locations. Each plant is a little different, serving a different industry. And you can see that down in the middle of the United States, there's not a lot of dots there. Uh, and that area is serviced by one of our competitors, uh, a worthy competitor called Ripple Glass. Uh, and we can go to the next slide. Next. Almost 3 million tons of glass are recycled into all these various applications. Right now, there's more demand for recycled glass in the container industry and the fiberglass industry than we can supply. So we need more recycled glass. Next. Everyone knows, and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but glass is a cost-saving material. It never wears out. It can be recycled forever. A six-pack creates enough fiberglass insulation to fill a wall cavity. Recycling takes glass takes 30% less energy to produce glass than using virgin materials. Uh, recycling glass, you don't have to go out and mine. work it out in the background. Um, but uh, I think Kelly will be back in just a second and ready to move you along. Okay. Well, now we want to talk about collection strategies. There's curbside collections. A lot of folks are used to putting their recyclables next to the curb in a, a container. Those are usually now single stream materials go to a MRF and they're separated at the MRF. Unfortunately, that creates contamination and most of the material that we get is less than 60% usable glass by the time it leaves the MRF and comes to one of our plants. However, it is the largest volume of material. So we are working to handle that material both better separation processes at the MRF and our plants. The next opportunity that we have are drop-off sites. These are very popular in rural locations, but recently we've seen urban locations also utilize drop-off sites. And apparently a well-marked uh, drop-off site with good instructions creates enough groundswell that the urban folks will be use those and the glass is very, very clean. However, it is somewhat less volume per capita than curbside. People have to want to recycle. And finally, uh, to the heart of today's presentation is the private collectors. Commercial establishments such as bars and restaurants uh, generate about a third of the total glass volume. Uh, most multifamily apartment complexes and 
uh, multifamily condominiums are not serviced by municipalities. So that creates an opportunity for a private collector. Strategic materials, we're a processor, we're a manufacturer, we're not a collector. So we foster a lot of business relationships with private collectors. Next slide, please. The way we foster that is we pro provide knowledge in the collections methods, sales tools. Uh, when a private collector goes to a bar or restaurant, the bar or restaurant, first thing they say is, well, why should I bother with this? I can just throw it in the trash and they haul it away. Well, certainly it costs something to haul that away and we have uh, spreadsheets available that help that bar or restaurant uh, understand that they can recycle the glass for less money than the trash in some cases. Uh, we've been able to uh, help folks with branded containers, uh, customize in areas for local partnerships, and I think Chris will follow up on that also. Uh, we try to provide local partnerships and community involvement. Uh, we frequently will provide uh, expertise for wine festivals and things of that nature. Uh, glass handling techniques and the best trucks to use uh, and how to create a bunker system. Uh, and finally, we, we offer business guidance to those small collections business. And, and one thing that I'm quite pleased with, in the last month, we have found a way to pay people immediately. Uh, and, and traditionally, in industry to industry, there's a 45 day time lag. Well, we found a way in the last month so that we can pay the small collector immediately upon uh, receipt of his product. Next slide, please. Why bother with strategic materials? Well, we do have 50 facilities. Uh, we do have a commitment to our collectors. Uh, we can disperse business knowledge, guidance. That's a main portion of my job. Uh, we have training information available, both to train the bars and restaurants, to train the collectors. Uh, we try to make the business relationship easy. Uh, and again, the immediate payment. Next slide, please. I'm done. I certainly hope somebody's got some questions that we'll be sending. Thank you. This is my contact information. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Chris Fisher. I own Fisher Recycling. We started collecting glass 26 years ago in the Charleston Tri-County. Am I still on? Yeah, sorry, there. Chris. We're trying to uh, switch presenters here so that um, so that we can give you a more seamless presentation. But <laughs> so far, that hasn't worked super well. Here we go. Uh, how does that look, folks? <laughs> Uh-oh, got to get rid of this and rid of that. Okay. You ready, Chris? I'm ready. Good afternoon. I uh, hope all's well. Thank everyone for logging in. I've been collecting glass in the Charleston Tri-County area for about 26 years. In our programs, we will supply all the containers for in-house behind the bars, um, with the weight stations, roll carts for outside collection. We will not, we don't do dumpsters. It's only a roll cart system that we use up to a 64 gallon. We're finding that the weight of the glass, it's easier to maintain and it helps on the workman's comp of all the staff also. The glass is transported in our collection vehicles to a North Charleston facility where we put it in the bunkers. And from the bunkers, we will reuse up to 25% of the glass 
in our glass manufacturing program where I make one of a kind or volume countertops. We do stairwells, we'll do tiles, um, shower walls, and then custom pieces for other people. The remaining 75% of the glass will go to Strategic, who's been an outstanding partner. I can't say enough good things about the company. They really stepped up to the plate and helped us get rid of the glass and reuse everything that we're doing. Um, I'm hoping there's a lot of qu some questions about what we do and how it works, but education is the key and trying to educate people on how to get rid of the glass properly and why it's good and then getting them to pay for it. The glass cannot be collected unless you pay for it. Some, there always has to be a money transfer on the front end. Don't go start a program, please don't, unless you're gonna get paid on the front end. Um, the goal, our next goal is to set up the Greenville Spartanburg area, possibly South Atlanta, Georgia, and then Columbia, South, South Carolina also. So I just wanna make my presentation short and sweet. I wanted to thank everybody for listening in. Thanks, Chris. While we tee up some questions here, can you tell us a little bit about how you approach bars and restaurants and, um, and what kinds of uh, issues you confront, things that move them or interest them as you're talking to bars and restaurants about recycling glass? Um, we always want to talk to the owner first. He is go to the number one decision maker, um, identify that there'll be 30% of his waste stream will immediately be reduced. So the second step would be to do a waste audit on his whole system. How many times is his dumpster picked up? What's the size of the dumpster? And then back out the numbers of 30% from there. Um, the sales point would be supplying the containers and educating his staff, providing window stickers, and then giving him public recognition also. Great. Um, so we have a number of questions that have come in. And um, so we'll start with a question that came for Derek. Um, Derek, we have someone on the line who has um, tried to recycle cartons before and has had some issue with end markets. Can you speak to um, the end markets available for cartons? So there are various in markets that are available. It depends on which area of the country that this individual is in. And so I would be glad, Risa, that they would like to send uh, send the contact info to them. I'll have a specific conversation. But there was a period where we had in market problems. We do have a new facility that is coming on in Korea that's going to take quite a bit of tons per month. In the center of the comp country, a company called Rewall, as Mitch will be talking in the next session, Rewall is taking four to the 600 tons per month of cartons as well. And that's a pretty unique, unique program where they just grind the entire carton up and basically melt it and press it together and make wall boards, ceiling panels, and those sorts of things. So yeah, and we'll be, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, we'll be hearing from Rewall on our next webinar. So first who, folks who wanna know more about that, tune in on December 4th. Sorry, Derek, go ahead. Another mill in the upper Midwest, two mills accepting cartons today, and then and then we're looking at another facility coming online potentially next year to, to accept cartons as well. So there are some facilities out there, there are some brokers out there. We could also connect you with brokers as well in order to move and, and process cartons. So be glad to talk individually as well with someone on, on end market. Thank you. Great, thanks, Derek. Um, the next question I think is for Kara. It came in during her presentation. Kara, there was a question from um, someone in Michigan about noticing that uh, there's there's no Michigan dot in the current program and wondering um, if uh, there's a way to get, get Michigan to join. Perhaps you can speak to the relationship between states and the public sector and the program and how they can help move things along. Sure. Um, well, right now, like I said, the program is only in um, grocery stores. And when you say Michigan DOT, do you mean the Department of Transportation? No, no, I'm sorry. They, uh, Michigan wasn't identified on the uh, map as a state that was participating now. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm like, well, not in the Department of Transportation yet, but we have okay, talked sorry. about, um, no problem. Um, we have talked about expanding 
um, the program to other types of food service um, industries. But so how they can um, get connected. Um, well, right now we have a series of chains. And so we aren't, um, we don't contact the stores, you know, store by store. We try to start um, from the top and go to the chains. Right now we have um, Hannaford, Weiss, Del Hayes, Ahold, and Publix, which are all um, grocery stores that are included in the program, but we're always working to expand that. But if someone from a municipality is interested in getting um, one of their grocery stores involved, um, we would um, really just suggest going to the store, um, talking to some of the management, and finding out how they can reach the higher levels in the chain. Okay, great. Thanks, Kara. Um, we got a question on glass, and uh, Bill, I'm going to ask you if you want to respond to this. I think I can provide a little commentary, but we'll see what you think. Um, okay. Jamie Bailey's asking, saying they've heard recently about some jurisdictions that have stopped taking glass in their recycling program, and wondering how widespread that trend is. Do you want to speak to that? Would you like me to take a crack? Why don't you start and I'll chip in. Okay, um, so we, uh, we're we definitely seeing some some um, areas where glass is has been a problem. We ta I talked at the beginning about the challenges uh, that many municipal programs face and, and the costs of managing glass and curbside is certainly one of those. Um, I, I don't think we, we do closely track that through the Glass Recycling Coalition. Um, it, I don't think we would we would consider that a widespread trend, um, but we do see uh, those conversations starting to happen. Um, but what we also see is a lot of innovation um, around how to collect clean bottle glass, um, like the program you heard about today with Fisher Recycling and Strategic, and also um, innovation in how to process MRF glass to high-end markets, which we highlighted on the last webinar. So um, I would encourage folks out there if your municipality is is facing concerns about glass to uh, reach out to the Glass Recycling Coalition, take a look at the last webinar we did, um, and uh, and uh, work through that. Uh, but I don't think we would consider that a very widespread trend. Do you want to add anything, Bill? Yeah, I do. Uh, surprisingly, the glass industry has more myths and rumors about it than any other recycling industry, I believe. Uh, I visited a location yesterday less than 20 miles from our uh, Atlanta processing plant. And the reason I went, their website said that it's just too difficult to recycle glass. And it, it said that you had to sort by color, which is not true. It said that uh, the, the broken glass on the ground required uh, full-time maintenance, which is not true. Uh, and, and so many myths about this uh, and the fact that glass is only 6% of the recycling uh, stream, whereas glass is somewhere generally accepted to be around 22% of the recycled, available recyclables. And, and it's because no one comes out and says this is not correct, this is not true, that these myths are allowed to propagate. Uh, part of what I do is I confront the, the, the myths, uh, I confront the, the folks, and we attempt to get it uh, on the straight and narrow. Uh, this location that I visited yesterday could indeed make money by allowing a glass drop off at their facility and transport it to our uh, College Park plant. And it would be a money maker for them, uh, not a money loss, because today it probably costs them $40 a ton to put it in the landfill. Uh, we can help. Please contact someone in the glass recycling business, myself, my competitor, uh, if you have a, a glass issue like this. Risa, um, this is Kara. I just wanted to add a little bit to um, the last question that came to me from someone in Michigan. Sure. Um, 
I think really another great thing to do would be to simply contact APR. Um, because like I said, um, we work with the chains as well as even the companies that, companies that have several chains below them like A-Hold, which includes Stop and Shop. And in contacting us, just let us know what your local chain is that you would like to see this type of program um, get started. And then we can kind of take it from there and contacting them. Great. Thanks, Kara. And there was someone from Ohio who asked a similar question. So you may hear from Ohio as well. That would um, be great. The next question I have is also for you, Kara. Uh, it's about um, the national sword China policy and with China tightening down its importing rules, do you see any opportunity for domestic processing of lower value plastic resins that have in the past gone overseas um, via export markets? If not, what do you think is going to happen to the markets for these resins? Well, when we're talking about the material that's included in our grocery rigids programs, those definitely would not be affected at all by um, what's happening in China. This material is um, completely separated. Um, it's clean uh, material. It's separated by resin. So this material is really high demand domestically. Um, for the other types of um, lower grade plastics that you were talking about, I assume you mean maybe some like mixed plastics and things like that um, that have often gone to China in the past. Um, what we're really hoping for at APR is to see this as an opportunity domestically for you know the sortation facilities to really um, invest in the technology to um, provide additional sorts in their facilities. And of course, um, we're also looking for the other end of, of that um, circle to step up to the plate and really increase the demand of recycled plastics. So um, we, you know, of course it is gonna affect the market, but we're hoping that, you know, we can just rebound and um, really take advantage of the opportunities that are available domestically. But again, like I said, the material that we're talking about in the Grocery Rigids program, Really, I wouldn't see that being affected at all. Those markets will continue to be very strong. Right, and those are domestic markets predominantly for that high-grade polypropylene and polyethylene, right, Kara? Yes, and um, if you need any information about who those markets might specifically be, um, you can go to the APR website and click on markets, and we have a complete listing of all the APR members that per purchase both HDPE and polypropylene, along with their contact information. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we are at the hour, um, so I'm going to close at this point. We have a couple folks who had their hands raised, um, and I apologize uh, that we weren't able to get to your questions. Please do email those in, and, uh, and we will get them to the speakers to make sure sure you get good answers to those. Um, I want to thank our speakers for giving us some great presentations today, and thanks to all of you for joining us. And again, please join us on our next webinar um, on December 4th, and, uh, and, and stay tuned for information about our January webinar. Um, thank you so much, and have a great day. Thanks, Risa.